surgery to improve upon the local control of a tumor. Um, so throughout the course of one's oncologic diagnosis, around 50 to 60 percent of people will end up with radiation at some point. Um, so our technology is really what kind of sets us apart. Um, we're utilizing x-rays, uh, so not all that different from a chest x-ray, to treat a tumor. And what happens is you give repeated x-ray doses over time, and you can get a gradual response uh, in the mass, and uh, you try to lessen the side effects of the normal surrounding tissues by targeting that therapy. And that's what um, we've really been doing for the last really 10 to 15 years, this image-guided radiation therapy. And we use CT scans built into the head of a machine. So for instance, this picture is a, linea a linear accelerator. The um, head of the machine, the patient is laying on the table. Uh, there's imaging built into the machine so that patients are positioned in a way that's reproducible, and then we take imaging uh, with them in that position to make sure that we're hitting the actual target. And once we're happy with the positioning, we then uh, proceed with the actual treatment, which is usually delivered in just a series of a few minutes. And where we're going as a field, which has been predominantly driven by its technology, is to try to advance more into the next stage with what we call biology-guided radiation therapy. And maybe I can get the slides to move. Not going yet. There we go. Um, so, what what I mean by biology guided radiation, we've been guided by really some really basic principles with in terms of our treatments. We would give each treatment's called a fraction, and what we would do is we would give multiple fractions over a period of time, say five weeks, and we give usually one treatment a day. Um, there are some studies that say maybe giving twice a day is better. But we basically manipulate the amount of radiation that we give in that fractionation scheme, and that's our prescription. Uh, so unlike a medical oncologist who might write for a certain milligram or dosage of a chemotherapy, uh, we're changing and altering our dose prescription uh, to manipulate changes within the tumor or to protect the normal tissues. And that's been a guiding principle from really the advent of the x-ray. So if you go back to when the x-ray was invented, they started usually within six months of its advent utilizing it to treat cancers. And they were usually tumors that were superficial, so let's say a skin cancer. And they would really just do these repeated x-rays until the skin got red and burnt. And they wrote down and they studied different fractionation schemes to get to that skin reaction that would then eventually correspond to tumor regression. And our science has really been at that level in many ways for the last hundred years. And it's not until more recent that we've really figured out a way to manipulate that. Um, so that's where we're headed in terms of a field. Um, and we'll see if we can move this again. And we'll go over this a little bit more. Sorry, I'm not able to go to the next slide here. Uh, is that it? Uh, yeah, let's go there. So uh, what I think of uh, biology guidance, I, I kind of put it in this uh, perspective of, of viewing the world from kind of a outer space kind of view. Um, if we were to look at down at the world, we could tell where the water is, where the mountains are, perhaps the deserts, but we really get very little in terms of functionality and this is really where we've been uh, in terms of radiation delivery. We can see the tumor um, as long as it has you know a size and a mass to it but we cannot actually get any idea about functionality and that's where we're go going as a field. Next slide. So in terms of doing this in the human what we would do is 
or in our world view, it would basically be taking a step back and just waiting 12 hours. So if we wait 12 hours in this concept, we start to get an idea of functionality. We get an idea of where the pulse of our world is coming from, where the population is, uh, density is really happening. And we can really do that within a tumor utilizing some newer and some advanced imaging techniques. Have the next slide. And you can just advance through these and I'll work through them that way. So this is the oh sorry that's the so that's the concept of biology guided radiation therapy is that we can use advanced imaging uh, such as something called a PET scan uh, which can give us an idea of how quickly the tumor is replicating. We can utilize radiation to cause DNA damage within the tumor, and then we can now manipulate that with newer drugs that are coming available, and we can image that response and now we can alter our treatments to be a little bit more uh, customized to the patient and provide more personalized care. Next slide. I mentioned that conventionally we have always used some pretty simple techniques to understand the biology, and that was that process of called fractionation, which is just the number of treatments you give. But depending on how you give those, um, you can alter different things within the tumor. So why we give a day in between each treatment, or we treat Monday through Friday and not Saturday and Sunday, is we're allowing for normal tissue repair. So normal tissue can repair can happen in that 24-hour period in between each treatment. Um, that also allows cells to enter into more sensitive phases where they would be more likely to respond to our radiation. Um, there's a process that if you were to break the radiation in the middle of the treatment and give a gap, for instance, it's called a split course. Um, that's always been found to be a negative outcome um, because what happens is you've killed off the more sensitive cells uh, early on in the course, and what's left behind are more resistant cells that if there's that time gap, there can be regrowth, and that's called repopulation. Um, by giving these gaps in between treatments, you're getting better blood flow to the tumor or you're allowing responses to happen and new blood uh, supplies can develop so that you can get uh, a better treatment effects. And the predominant mechanism which radiation works is by really interacting with the water within the body and splitting that water molecule to create free radicals that would then divide, which damages the dividing cells. Can you go ahead and advance this a couple? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of whatever else is maybe shown on the slide. Okay, perfect. So what is in contrast to that is a technique called radiosurgery, and it's really just a fancy name for more pinpoint focused radiation. Um, so in this instance, you're really taking advantage of the technology to produce a response that is really focused right at the, at the tumor, and you're avoiding the normal tissue and giving a bigger dose per treatment. Um, biologically, it has a different effect. Um, perhaps you can get different uh, interactions with not only the tumor, but you're maybe affecting the vasculature that's supporting that tumor, uh, causing its uh, apoptosis within the um, vasculature, which then subsequently has the tumor go away. And now we're thinking that even with radiosurgery techniques, we may be differentiating and causing a different immune response. And that, my guess is throughout the lectures that you guys have maybe heard throughout the summer, at some point somebody's talked about immune therapy as being one of the more recent trends in terms of how we manage our cancer patients. And immune therapy works by harnessing the body's own immune system to do the subsequent uh, tumor um, control processes, unlike chemotherapy, which kills the dividing cells. So in this instance, radiation can perhaps work in a way that causes either antigen to be presented or disrupts the tumor in a way that makes the immune therapy either work better or actually start working again. And that's some of the stuff that we've been doing in some of the labs here. Next slide. Sorry. Okay. So what we've been working on is really trying to understand how DNA damage happens in, in the, inside the tumor. That's really the um, main mechanism in which our therapies work. 
and we've developed drugs that have targeted some of the earlier processes in terms of how DNA divides and, da and damage is repaired. So the idea is that if you can prevent repair in the tumor, you can increase the radiation response. You just have to do it selectively so that the normal tissues surrounding it don't have an, an excessive amount of damage. And there, these drugs and these targets were identified by really looking at individuals who are exquisitely sensitive to radiation. Um, so there are some genetic disorders where even the lowest amount of x-ray exposure or even sun exposure can cause um, malignancies to form and there is horrible DNA um, damage repair defects that leads them uh, with multiple health problems. And that's been isolated and characterized. And our goal has always been, well, let's try to create that environment within the tumor, let's but protect the normal tissues. You can go ahead to the next slide. So one of the drugs that we've been looking at in the clinic, or even in our laboratory, is this drug called an ATR inhibitor. And this is a targeted therapy that works on one of the earliest kinases that gets activated by DNA damage. So when DNA damage happens within the cell, uh, we would expect the tumor to respond quite quickly and it would go away. And unlike that of our expected outcomes, we didn't see a response in the tumor to really a delayed time point. So it wasn't out until you got closer to 35 days that the curve started separating. And when you see a curve that looks like this delayed response, it often makes us think that this is more along the lines of an immune-related response, which takes time, versus that of a DNA damage effect. So a drug that should have been designed as a DNA damaging agent was really acting and more so like an immune therapy. And we've now kind of gone into the process of trying to characterize this interaction and how we can manipulate that even in our clinics. Next slide. So this delayed response, we've looked at it and we've taken out the immune system within these mice and all of a sudden you, the tumor response goes away if you do not have a functional immune system. And it gets beyond and it starts allowing us to start characterizing some of these non-DNA damage effects that radiation has. So it does have altered um, biological principles that we're now trying to dive more uh, deeper in terms of understanding the biology of radiation and how we can manipulate that with our therapies. And go ahead to the next slide. And basically, we're going from this idea of over on the left side of your screen, these DNA damage part where we are utilizing these different agents, and we're linking it back over to what you see on the right side. You can just fast forward through this a couple slides. And we're figuring out how radiation upregulates something called PDL1. And this is that a target of a lot of the drugs that you see either in commercials or along the you know billboards kind of driving down the road. Um, that radi there are drugs, one of which is called Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. Uh, there's one called Nivolumab or Opdivo. These target the markers of of the immune system and it allows the, the radiation to uh, to have its effects. So in general, radiation was thought to upregulate this thing called PDL1. One moment, sorry, I lost the uh, Sorry if I changed the screen there. Oh, no, it's probably my fault. I was trying to, uh, someone had submitted a, a possible way to make it work, and I probably screwed it up. But anyway, radiation drives up this PDL1 expression, which we thought is actually a good thing. It turns out clinically that's not such a great um, thing to happen, and these drugs can actually up prevent the upregulation of this thing called PDL1. And that's the mechanism and how it potentially works. Can just can we fast forward past this one. This one, or to the next one? Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Let's um, no, let's keep going. Yeah. So this is good. So what happens is that 
in that scenario, that when if you're delivering radiation in this combination of drugs, we're actually getting radi blocking that radiation increased PDL1 expression, which I said is in this instance is not a good thing. And when you do that, that's how we're starting to see the response. And we can characterize the cells and take those cells out of the animal and look and see what the environment's really ha what's happening there. You can go fast forward a couple slides. So we can stop. Let's stop. Let's go back one. So once we've characterized these mice, and they're and we figured out that the immune cells that have now gone into the tumor and actually caused its effect um, actually are secreting cytokine and all the things that we need to make a tumor go away, um, there are some mice that were actually cured by this approach. And what's neat about it is actually if you re-challenge those mice by putting a tumor in, on, let's say, six months later, and you put it in the opposite side of the mouse, these mice will not form tumors at that point. They've remained almost vaccinated from that, uh, from achieving any additional tumor. And it's that idea that radiation in this drug creates this combination and this me memory uh, that happens within the mouse that we are trying to manipulate now clinically. So the idea is if you can use this and you can pull out even the immune cells that are causing this beneficial effect, you can perhaps grow that, expand it, and even give that back into the patient. And that's some of the bases for the targeted cell therapies that we're giving now, some of which called um, CAR-T therapy, and I'm sure you'll hear some different talks about all the cell-based therapy approaches that are happening um, um, now. You can kind of move on. You can just go through all that. So how to make this a little bit more beneficial Clinically is how do we, number one, can we utilize it within our treatment paradigms, what's really happening clinically, and can we adapt in a real, more rapid, real-time fashion. Um, one of the drugs that's gained a lot of traction over the last few years in terms of its utilization in the clinics is a drug called nivolumab, um, and it was approved for multiple malignancies, um, one of which is head and neck cancer. And some of this is pretty sobering, and when you see an individual that has disease that's spread beyond the head and neck region, when you our standard therapies really live, lead to a minimal survival. So many times in this scenario, patients will live about five months. And while it doesn't seem dramatic, um, the improvement from five months to seven and a half months was one of the biggest steps forward that we've had in the last um, really decade in terms of how we manage patients with metastatic head and neck cancer. Uh, can you just kind of uh, advance one? So the problem is that that response is really limited and we can't predict who those individuals are going to respond. So it, there's about 15% where there's a long-term uh, benefit and we're trying to manipulate the environment now to really understand who those uh, individuals might be. And one of the things we're doing is changing the type of PET scans that we have. Um, the one PET scan that I showed you earlier would show you the dividing uh, cells. So if it shows up bright on a PET scan, it's representing the tumor and how quick the division process is. Or other tissues that are utilizing sugar as its main energy source. So we're trying to develop new PET tracers and that are actually targeting the immune system. So it's a different concept. If we know that there's a certain characterization of a tumor that's going to respond to an immune therapy and we can image it, we can perhaps give different therapies beforehand that we can then detect on in an imaging standpoint and then reinitiate that immune therapy and see if it would start working again. Go ahead and advance the slide. This was a mouse model where we were able to radiate different areas within the mice, and we would detect over time how the changes in the expression of that marker that I mentioned that often predicts when the drug nivolumab is going to work. Um, so we've been um, doing various mouse experiments and trying to characterize how this process happens because eventually we want to move it back into the clinic. And that's called translating uh, and translational care. 
advance the slide one. You can go ahead one more. So this is, comes along these novel imaging strategies. We're trying to understand how radiation induces an immune response and then how we can modulate that with, again, changing the prescription that we can control. The only things we can change, again, are dose, how often we give that dose, and then can we deliver therapies that we can actually see. And that's that concept that I brought up early on of biology-guided radiation. So I'll show some new technology and some of the new toys that are kind of coming into our clinic, and we'll go from there. Next slide. So this is just a background idea, and what we know is that when we talk about a cancer, there's, our goal is to always identify it early in its course, when it's localized to the site of origin. Unfortunately, the majority of cancers that we see actually move to other areas. And this process is called metast metastatic spread, and they can be spread to various areas within the body. So, for instance, a lung cancer can spread to the brain, it can spread to the adrenal glands, it can spread to bone. Um, there was work early on, can you just uh, click one button, please? There was work early in the setting of colorectal carcinoma where patients with a primary tumor developing within the colon, which often moves to the liver, um, there were patients that had both the primary site removed as well as the site distant from it removed from the liver. So you resect the primary tumor and you take out the spots in the liver. What our conventional teaching would be that those individuals would develop disease really spread throughout the whole body. And what we're seeing is that some of those patients are having really extended survival, some of which about 25 to 30 percent of patients are alive at 10 years with no disease. And it really brought up this idea of surgical metastectomy. Um, so that's surgical removal, but I mentioned that radiation can act in a similar way, and it perhaps even has some advantages that it can be immune stimulatory. So we are now utilizing that technique called radiosurgery to provide the same uh, type of treatment. Can you fast forward one? Sure. And you can just kind of go through those pictures. Okay, so the concept of radiosurgery was pioneered by a surgeon called, his name was Lars Lexel. He was a Swedish neurosurgeon, and he wanted to come up with a way of delivering pinpoint focused radiation within the brain. And he used a head frame that would allow the individual to be immobilized and positioned multiple radiation sources in a helmet that would then um, be delivered. And this machine is still utilized today. It's called a gamma knife. And it was one of the first machines that we really started delivering this pinpoint focus type of radiation. The next slide over, which kind of shows that industrial robot, which you've probably seen on commercials, building uh, cars and things like that, that's called a cyber knife. Uh, what that machine allowed us to do was move from treatment within the brain but to actually treat and target and track, utilizing robotic guidance, tumors that were perhaps moving within the lung, which is kind of depicted in that um, brightly colored PET scan right below that. Um, on the bottom left is a modern linear accelerator. This one's called TrueBeam. These are all able and capable of delivering pinpoint focused radiation. And that, again, that's called radio surgery or what we now even sometimes refer to as SABER, which is stereotactic ablative radiation. You can go on to the next slide. What we're trying to do now is we're actually trying to combine all of these with advanced imaging techniques. So I've talked a lot about PET scans. Um, PET scans can allow us to detect disease um, in various areas of the body. So usually when someone's diagnosed, they will get a PET scan to see if it's limited just to the primary site or to other areas in the body. And there's a new machine that's being developed that allows you to integrate a PET scan in combination with the radiation delivery approach. Uh, maybe let's go to the next slide. And it's called a, the machine's called Reflection. But the idea with it is that a patient would be dosed with a PET tracer 
and the machine can detect that signal. So when it's detecting a positron, the actual signal itself is serving as a beacon for where that tumor is located in the body. And what the engineers did is, you know, I guess you, guessing you guys have seen the fountains that are in front of the Bellagio in Las Vegas. They hired the engineer from the Bellagio fountain because of how fast that those fountains and this, the way that the, um, the fountains will dance almost to the music, they wanted to be able to create a machine that could react uh, just as fast. So they re-engineered the machine from the ground up, and they can actually detect these signals, and the machine can rotate fast enough that it can almost shoot back instantaneously at that, um, that lesion within the body. So we can maybe advance a couple. We'll see if it shows some of the videos or how it works. So that's kind of just depicting that shooting back process. And go on to the next slide. This is the video. I'm not sure that it will work, but we can maybe try it. So this was just kind of depicts how this whole process works. Um, this has a CT scanner that are typical of most radiation machines that can allow for localization. It has the one energy linear accelerator in the same geometry as the PET detector. And when you do that, you can actually not only detect that positron, but you can actually create an image that you could look at after the treatment to see how the patient responded uh, during the treatment course. So this is within the head of the machine. This is called the multi-leaf collimator. So it's as the x-rays are being shot out of that, they are manipulated and modulated. So in this instance, a patient would get a dosing of a PET tracer, most likely something like FDG, which is a sugar um, um, analog that would detect multiple areas within the body. And let's say there's three or four areas within the lung. The patient would be positioned on the table they would have a CT scan performed for localization. That localization CT scan would be mapped and compared to what you did in terms of planning to make sure that the patient was positioned absolutely perfectly prior to starting the therapy. A pet, during that time, a PET signal would be being emitted, which could be detected by the machine. And the idea would be that during that pet detection, you would be able to manipulate the machine fast enough to deliver x-rays back at the tumor within the body. So it's almost an instantaneous-like treatment and an automated process that in future modeling of this machine will look somewhat like your self-driving Uber cars that uh, you see kind of driving around here in Pittsburgh now. Okay, advance on beyond this. So not, that was kind of an example of using a, a pet tracer called FDG. There are multiple other pet tracers out there, some of which are specific for certain types of cancers, such as PMSA, which is specific for prostate cancer, and is it will be approved um, to be utilized clinically in the next month or two. Um, the first machine that I was similar to the one that I just described is being installed right now at Stanford. Uh, that will be the first one available. And hopefully this will allow us to kind of progress more towards a personalized approach to cancer care and allow us to adapt more specifically to the biology that's happening within the patient and ultimately improve outcomes. Can you advance the slide? Um, you can go on past this. A couple more, please. Next. This is just, yeah, this is just an example of how we can treat deep-seated things within the body and the potential outcomes. So this was an example in pancreatic cancer. You can go ahead and go on to the end. So bottom line is we have multiple trials that we're conducting. Um, there'll be multiple click-throughs through this, but the idea is how can we manipulate DNA damage to interact with the immune system and advance our therapeutic, therapeutics that are utilized in various malignancies. Um, any questions for me?
right. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to either speak up or uh, to type them in the chat. Um, so we currently have uh, one question uh, in the chat uh, from Sam. Uh, for VGRT, would it require multiple runs? Yeah, so that's that's a bit actually an extremely important question. Um, the concept of radio surgery, when it was in its original concept by that guy Lars Lexel, the idea was that it would be delivered in a single session, similar to a surgery. Um, ra once radiation oncologists kind of started expanding it, we've allow we've relaxed that a little bit to up to about five sessions in this country at least and. In the setting of BGRT, the ideal will be to use a single treatment, which will allow for only one dosing of that radio tracer um, and make things a little bit more efficient. But I, it will be there will be some opportunities and some tracers. For instance, if we use that one that I mentioned in terms of the immune system, you might want to start by treating five tumors within the patient and re-scan the next time to see if the, you've changed the way that the immune cells are circulating into the other tumors. And if it's increased, you could, you're perhaps done with the treatment. But if there's still what we call cold tumors, you could still continue with the metabolic ablation of those other areas. So it, the long, short answer is between one and five treatments. Thank you. Else, any questions? Um, are there any types of like normal cells that the PT um, tracer will target? Yeah, so there is normal. So if we're talking about FDG, so which is the sugar analog, that will go to the brain. It shows up bright in the voice box or areas where there's muscle activity. The heart shows up bright. The kidneys, so what they do is, if you think, how the, normally sugar should not be excreted by the kidney. Sugars are reabsorbed and into the body and not in the urine, uh, except in the setting of diabetes. What they do as part of this PET tracer is they manipulate it so that it can't be reabsorbed by the kidney and is excreted in the urine. Um, so when we're using it for planning, what we have to do is there are people that are working at the machine, usually not the physician, they're called radiation therapists or even dosimetrists where they do the planning. But what they will do is they will identify the region of interest. So if you know you're treating the lung, they'll kind of create a little targeted area or a focus area to exclude out the normal uptake in those tissues that I mentioned before. So does that mean that this type of treatment wouldn't, shouldn't really be used for things like tumors in the brain or in, near the heart? Uh, yeah, so not with the tracers that we talked about, right? Because if, if within a FDG PET, the entire brain would show up bright, but there are tracers that perhaps show what an area called... Um, hypoxia, for instance. Hypoxia means an area where there's little oxygen. So, and that's usually thought to be the more resistant areas of the tumor. Um, so there's a tracer that can identify hypoxia. In that instance, that may actually serve as an area where you would want to increase the dose to, and that could be detected uh, with that novel PET tracer, and it wouldn't be in the normal brain tissue. So you just have to change your tracer around a little bit. And in the setting of the heart, it really is usually one area along the left ventricle that shows up bright. So you could really just exclude that area so that the machine wouldn't be detecting that. Do you use more than one tracer at the same time? Um, not yet, no. Um, there are some tracers that are being developed that have a kind of dual purpose. Some are meant for imaging, but you can actually target and link a radionucleotide to that. So perhaps like a calcium analog that would go to areas where there's tumor turnover. 
um, in a bone, you can link that to something called radium-223, which delivers radiation right to that spot. It's an IV type of radiation. But there are some characteristics within that that you could actually image some of the admissions. But it's not commonly done. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right. Um, all right, well, thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Kwan, for coming and giving a talk. Um, yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, for everyone else, uh, if you are, if uh, you have any questions, I'll stick around for